As mentioned earlier, I run our financial regulation studies area. So in a sort of twisted way, this is kind of a neat little study of the union for me because I'm not used to, with the exception of the last few years, banking, mortgage finance being talked about in the state of the union, but it will be talked about. I mean, you, and you don't even need to look at housing starts or foreclosures or any of these numbers. All you need to do is look at the paper every day to see that our housing market, our mortgage market, pretty much sucks. And again, the, 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 reason for, the reason that that has a bigger issue on the economy is twofold. One, when we have less housing wealth, we feel poorer, we spend less, and that reduces <laughs> consumer spending. We also have to look at it in terms of if there's probably anything that's going to determine this election, it is the labor market. Forty percent of the job losses during this downturn were a direct result of the housing market. Things like construction workers, things like real estate agents. I'm not even talking about the secondary uh, knockoff effects. So from the president's perspective, from anybody's perspective in terms of the economy, getting the housing market moving again is going to be issue number one. So I expect the president to talk a lot about the housing market, and I expect him to talk a lot about how do we want to do about the mortgage market. And again, one of the options I think we're going to hear is an expansion of, for instance, refinancing. Ilya talked about maybe potential write-downs. I'm going to come back and talk about why that's important and what the harm that would do. Now, of course, I want to talk very quickly about there are two fundamental problems with refinancing everybody's mortgage who is underwater. And the underwater essentially means you owe more on the mortgage than the house is worth. The first is that, yes, I could write down your mortgage, you would have more money, you would spend more, you would be wealthier. But I'm doing that at someone else's expense. Let's keep in mind, a mortgage is one person's liability, it is another person's asset. You are simply making one person better off while making another person worse off. And again, you know, despite the fact that I think this administration and often the last administration took the perspective that somehow the redistribution of wealth is the same thing as the creation of wealth, we should have learned over the last couple of years that transfer payments, redistribution of wealth does not turn your economy around. Again, this does not do anything for the economy, but it will do something in terms of politics. Because again, one of the themes we're going to hear tonight is fighting for the middle class while Republicans to defend bankers and defend the 1%. And again, you know, one of these things we're going to hear is, is a friend of the middle class is refinancing everybody's mortgage because you know you played right, you played by the rules. It's not your fault that housing prices went down. So of course the government's got to like underlie and, and guarantee uh, that liability for you. And so uh, you know. Not only does it do nothing for the economy, because as I mentioned, it's simply a transfer of wealth from one person to the other. Even worse, it does nothing for the housing market. If I refinance you into a lower rate in the mortgage you have, guess what? You're less likely to go out and buy another house. Why? You've got a cheaper rate. You would actually, when you look at it and say, I'm going to buy this house, but my mortgage would be 5 percent, now I've got 4, you are less likely to move. You are actually reducing home sales in the future rather than increasing them. And the way I think about it and the way I think you have to think about our housing market is we have a weak demand and excess supply. Any policy that does not increase demand or reduce the supply of housing is simply a joke and is simply a diversion. And be very clear, what we've heard planned so far, I think what we were here tonight will do very little in that regard on either front. Uh, again, I think it should be should kept in mind, and again, anybody who's had Econ 101 knows that if you have excess supply and insufficient demand, there is only one way to effectively cure that. You let prices fall to clear the market. Uh, absolutely, there is no other way. Um, and again, now why, maybe I should say the positive is that despite the best efforts of this administration and the last administration, housing prices have fallen over 30 percent nationally. I personally believe we are nationally probably about 90 percent through the depreciation in the housing market. Now the unfortunate part of that is we have dragged it out. We would have been far better off in my opinion to take that 30 percent over six months rather than over three years. And why is that? It's because my friends over at the home builders continue to add to supply as long as we hold prices above construction costs, which is what we've done. So instead of taking a halt and trying to work off the inventory we have, we have subsidized the additional supply when we're already in a glut. But again, you know, this reflects, I think, a perspective on the part of the White House that the problem is not the burst into the bubble. The problem, the problem is that we need to build a bridge to the next bubble. And that's, again, the liking of it. And again, we've seen this, and I'm going to come back to it and talk to this a little bit later about the Federal Reserve. But the attitude is that we need to simply replace one asset bubble with another, and that will make us all wealthier. Of course, that is not something that is going to work in the long run. Now, ideally, I would love to hear the President talk tonight about his plan for ending Freddie and Fannie. 
That should be on the top of the agenda. And the other government subsidies for the mortgage market. However, I expect him to do a very good job at talking about what more Freddie and Fannie could do while he, while he fails to mention the $170 billion we have so far put into bailing out Freddie and Fannie. At the end of the day, even according to CBO and according to their regulator, we are looking at as much as $300 billion to bail out Freddie and Fannie. I don't expect this to come up at all tonight. We're only going to hear if Freddie and Fannie would do more. Um, and again, uh, as was mentioned, the write down that Illy alluded to, the regulator for Freddie and Fannie said yesterday that if we did this sort of write down, it would cost us potentially another $100 billion. And again, let's keep in mind, this is a transfer from the taxpayer to borrowers who have mortgages that are over their head. And, and the worst part of this is it's regressive. Homeowners are wealthier than renters. Why should renters be forced to subsidize homeowners? This is supposed to be a progressive administration that they pretend to be. They pretend to be fighting for the 99%. Yet we will see a plan that says let's take and give money to people who don't need it. There's nothing that hurts you because your mortgage is worth more than your house. Um, anybody who has a car loan probably has a loan that is worth more than the value of the underlying asset. That does not mandate a government bailout. Um, that said, uh, unfortunately, despite the discussion that we will hear no uh, talk about Freddie and Fannie bailout, uh, in all likelihood, this will not be the only bailout. Uh, we will probably, in my opinion, have to bail out the Federal Housing Administration, FHA. I think ultimately we could be putting as much as another $50 billion into FHA. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind, and you know, I oppose the TARP, I think that those were bad things to do, but for the most part, the losses on the TARP were from the auditors, from the AIG. We've gotten most of that money back. We will not get the money back from Freddie and Fannie, and we will not get money back from FHA. Those are costs that will simply be hit, and again, we will not, we will not recover them. These are not investments to any extent of the imagination. These are simply transfers. Um, you know, and I think it's one thing that's, that's, that's lost as well, because I think one of the things we're going to hear tonight, and one thing we constantly hear, is this rhetoric against the banking industry. Um, but quite frankly, if you really wanted to stick it to the banking industry, let's get rid of Freddie and Fannie and FHA. They are ultimately ways for the banking industry to transfer credit risk to the taxpayer. And if you really want to stick it to the banks, let's make them take the credit risk. Actually, that's what they're there for, after all, uh, rather than making us take the hit every time the market goes south. Um, as was mentioned, in addition to refinancing, we might see the question raised about reducing the principal. So let's say your house, you've got a 20% down on your mortgage and the values decline 30%, so we're going to give you a 30, 10% write down, whatever, so that we make the value of your house, make the value of your mortgage. Now, of course, I should say as an aside, I have nothing against and I greatly encourage any lender who wants to sit down with any borrower to voluntarily, if they can work something out that they think that's in their interest, more power to them. That's what free markets are about, is coming to mutually beneficial exchanges. A forced write down, however, is something completely different, and it is nothing other than theft. Taken from the taxpayer or taken from the investor. And let's, let's keep in mind, whatever we're going to hear in the settlement today, whatever these things look like, it's often this picture of the banker being the investor. That's actually not the case. They are two separate entities. More often, you see the banker come to the table and wink and nod and say, yes, you know, AGs or government, I will give you this money. And these investors over here, pension funds, uh, you know, our retirement, that's what takes the hit. The banker walks away pretty clean. We get hit on this. And again, it is a transfer from taxpayers and investors. And, and why that should be the case, I think, has hardly been um, illustrated. So again, I, I will argue and, and, and see this repeated pretense that redistribution is wealth creation is one of the things that has actually harmed our economy rather than turned it around. I will also note as well that the primary driver of default in the mortgage market, as it is in almost any credit market, is because you're unemployed. And I'll give you the example again. If you were the quote-unquote responsible homeowner who put 20% down but you've lost 30%, you're only 10% underwater. If I write down your mortgage 10%, if you've lost your job, that's going to do nothing for you. So in a sense, what we're really seeing is a pitching of benefits and subsidies, uh, redistribution of wealth to the vast middle class who, quite frankly, don't need it. And, it. and again, it's coming out of their own pocket. It's a, I'm going to steal from your pension fund to make your house, you know, to lower your mortgage payment. And I'm going to make you think that somehow you're better off in that case. So again, there's nothing that can be done in that regard that's going to turn around the housing market. I do think that ultimately what the housing market is going to depend on now is the labor market. And again, things like Obamacare have only made benefits. The, it's actually quite interesting. If you look at benefits cost total compensation, let's ignore the inequality discussions about wages, because if you include benefits, it's simply not the case. We've actually increased the cost of hiring people over the last several years. 
No wonder it's, uh, there's been less hiring going on because it's more expensive to hire people. And a lot of that has been health care benefits. So again, I think if we made it easier and cheaper to hire people, we would turn our labor market around, which would turn our housing market around. Uh, Ilya mentioned the recent recess appointment to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, you know, in my opinion, I think that the recess appointment was clearly unconstitutional. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I occasionally read the Constitution, unlike some others. Um, but I don't, ex I don't expect the president to really make the case for saying why this is constitutional. I expect him to say that, you know, the Senate has obstructed me from, from working my will and the will of the people. And I will note, this is despite the fact that of all of the nominations submitted to the Senate in 2011, 97% of those nominations were ultimately confirmed by the Senate. This blocking of nominations is simply not correct. I encourage any of you to go over to Thomas or go to ILS and look at the Senate website. Those numbers are the facts. The overwhelming vast majority of nominees have been confirmed by the Senate. That one or two or a handful have been held up uh, is no reason for the Senate to the president to simply just rip up the Constitution. Um, I think we will hear a lot tonight about the implementation of Dodd-Frank, and again, it's, it's this juxtaposition of Republicans who are representing Wall Street, and, and President Obama will stand over here and say, forget the fact that I'm you know, holding hands with my buddy Tim Geithner and all the Goldman people in my administration. I'm really the one fighting for the middle class and taking on the banking industry. And of course, despite the many obvious feelings of Dodd-Frank, we are going to hear some defense of it that you need to reelect me, you need me, because if you elect someone else, we're going to see the repeal of Dodd-Frank, and it'll be back to the wild days days of quote-unquote banking deregulations, which of course never happened, uh, and we won't actually be dealing with the causes of the financial crisis, but I do think the other side of that is if, if Republicans do get the White House, the public, we all need to hold them accountable to actually do and address the causes of the financial crisis. Dodd-Frank did not do it, and I would say that simply repealing Dodd-Frank, while absolutely necessary, is insufficient. We have to go further. Um, I think we need to be able to bring back some market discipline. And this is what I would say. To me, if you were going to try to ch achieve one single thing with financial reform is you need to bring back market discipline, particularly on the part of creditors. People who lend to financial institutions must believe that their money is at risk. And the importance of this is that a properly freely functioning financial market, the price of borrowing acts as a break on the irresponsible, the criminal, the reckless, or the simply stupid. And what it means is that when you have a management that doesn't know what they're doing, they're following a bad strategy, other market participants will raise the cost of borrowing to them and will limit their exposure. They will stop lending to them. Creditors are the most important monitors and regulation we have in our financial markets. Unfortunately, decades of government intervention has severed this link. We basically say to creditors today, don't worry. If you lend to a too big to fail institution, we will bail you out. And of course, we've long done that to depositors so that you have little to worry about. And the importance of this is, of course, that 90 plus percent of the funding of any financial institution comes from creditors. You know, we simply cannot rely on management in the board alone to monitor. And of course, the government strategy has been, yes, we're going to create all this more hazard. We're going to protect creditors. But you know what? The government's going to come in and we're going to substitute for that monitoring of creditors. Uh, I think the repeated financial crises we have had is pretty good evidence that these regulators are simply not up to the task. They are not sufficient to substitute by, for regulation by creditors. I think of it as we have replaced weak incentives, which is, okay, if you're a bank regulator and the bank you regulate fail, well, you know, okay, we may transfer you somewhere. We're certainly not going to fire you because that would be too much to ask. We have these very weak incentives, and I'll even note one. I mean, one of the primary bank regulators during this crisis was the then president of the New York, New York Federal Reserve, Tim Geithner, and instead of for absolutely falling down on the job, what does he get a promotion? So again, you have these perverse, if not weak, incentives in the, among regulators, and we've replaced those with the very strong incentives that creditors would have. If you tell creditors that, listen, you invest and you don't monitor, you take a hit. You take a loss. And that's nothing like to wake somebody up like taking a big financial hit. Again, what we need to do is reimpose that market discipline on creditors to bring that monitoring, to bring actual real effective regulation, market regulation of behavior, rather than the government regulation that we have that is incredibly failed every time. Um, I should also mention that I think one of the largest sources of moral hazard, one of the largest sources of bailouts in our financial markets are the ones that are less transparent. Yes, we've seen the TARP and we've seen uh, these lending programs by the Federal Reserve, but even just as importantly, and I would argue more distortionary, is every time the financial markets get in trouble, the Federal Reserve floods the market with liquidity. 
here, I'm going to give you cheap money to drive up the value of the assets that you hold so that you speculators in the financial markets are better off. I've pushed up the value of your assets. And again, it doesn't matter that this uh, tries to create pushes inflation in the rest of the economy. It's, again, the sort of lender of last resort, the liquidity bailout that is constantly there. Um, and I, and then I think this is something that absolutely needs to be addressed. Um, the Fed has tried to do the same thing for households. After we had the dot-com bubble burst, the reaction of the Federal Reserve was, well, you know, we're all a little bit poorer, about by $8 trillion after the stock market burst. So let's create a housing market bubble. You know, let's try to make people feel wealthier because, of course, they will spend again. And we have seen this repeatedly. We've even seen it recently over the last several years where low interest rates have, you know, pushed up the stock market. They've pushed up commodity prices. And again, it's trying to make people who hold assets feel wealthier so they will spend more. It is not an economy where household wealth is based on fundamentals of investment and based on fundamentals of productivity. And so I think this constant manipulation of consumer spending via asset prices driven by monetary policy is incredibly dangerous and has led us to one bubble after another. It has been incredibly costly. It is it, it's, it's distorted relative prices. You've invested in the wrong things. Uh, we've reduced the efficiency of our economy, which ultimately means we are poorer because of it, not because wealthier. Now, I don't expect, uh, you know, I guess I should say on the one hand, I've been relatively optimistic, and certainly a lot of credit goes to Ron Paul for making all of the Republican nominees have to talk about the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, if anything, I expect that if the president says anything, he'll, you know, pat Ben Bernanke on the back and tell us what a great job he's been doing. Um, but, you know, this needs to be something that needs to be put on the table in the debates. Uh, and any serious discussion of our State of the Union would look at the value of our money uh, and the value of price stability and what we should do in that regard. And, of course, there are a lot of interim things you can do, whether it's removing the dual mandate, whether it's having some sort of inflation targeting. But I think ultimately, we cannot continue to believe that prosperity is brought to us by a series of asset bubbles. We need to have real growth in this country that is, again, brought by real investment that is determined by real prices, real interest rates, uh, and not distortions.